Nupin, my name is Gohar and uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Insmiles uh, 2019. So it was really started off uh, from a single room. Now it is working as uh, or uh, with 413 people, you know, working under and smile globally. A lot of things have changed in the last 12 months since ChatGPT was launched. For us, for an OEM company, so sales is a very integral part. And but our strategy is to open more countries and open new factories in different locations. I'm just thinking that why other companies are not able to do it. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to another new episode of the Digital Dentistry Deep Dive Podcast. This is a very special episode. I sat with Gohar Rahman, who is the CEO and founder of Ensmile Aligners. We spoke about his journey from you know a small beginnings for the company uh, with limited funding and starting that in Pakistan and now exporting to 18 countries, opening up a new factory in, in Portugal, going public in uh, Pakistan and now looking at opening a new factory in US as well. Uh, it was really good, exciting, uh, a very honest, uh, off the cuff uh, conversation. Uh, Gohar is, is is super humble and honest person who kind of opened up what what they are thinking behind the doors, what what's going on. It's a really good learning episode for anyone who is starting uh, their journey of uh, you know offering clear aligners or thinking of setting up something to uh, offer it to their clients. Uh, so really interesting episode. Uh, a gentleman, uh, uh, you know, one of the best persons that I've met. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy this episode uh, with Gohar Imam. Thank you. Hi, Gohar. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you very much, Nippon, for having me. And, you know, it is uh, great seeing that what you guys are doing. So it is wonderful. So again, thank you for having me today. So, so Gaur, I'll, I'll straight jump into the questions, okay? So mm -hmm. can you walk us through, because a lot of the audience, people who would be listening to this or hearing this, mm -hmm. um, they they may not know much about your journey. They may have heard of and smile or may have worked mm -hmm. with you or have discussed with you. So let's, I know you have a very interesting journey to talk about. So mm -hmm. I think let's, let's straight start from there. Uh, and, you know, maybe I'll ask questions in between uh, if you want to just start with the sure, first question. Sure, sure, sure. So like, uh, you know, Nupin, my name is Gohar and uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Ensmile. So, you know, like uh, many companies, as we hear the story, so Ensmile was, again, a very small company, you know, back in uh, 2019. So when we started off uh, in December 25th, to be exact, uh, 2019, so it was really started off uh, from a single room, you know, with uh, very much, you know, less resources as and as, you know, kind of a you know, a smaller startup, you can say. And, uh, you know, but God have been really graceful and grateful to us that uh, during uh, these three years or just in three years, we have become the public limited company. So, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, having uh, Ensmile as uh, a single owner company. So now it is working as uh, or uh, with 413 people, you know, working under Ensmile globally. And now we have uh, more than 18 uh, countries that we are working with and we are exporting our goods to more than 22 countries uh, on a monthly basis. And we have our own offices in more than five uh, countries, including the US uh, and obviously uh, Europe. And uh, we have uh, about three factories that we have of our own. So uh, one of our biggest factories, so it is in Asia, uh, specifically in Pakistan. That is where we started off, uh, like keeping in view that I come from the same originality. So, but then we opened another factory in, uh, you know, like in uh, Portugal. And then right now we are opening another factory in America as well. So, you know, then we would be having three, you know, locations which we would be supplying to our partners. So now uh, Ensmile has become a public limited company and now it is in the stock, uh, you know, share market. And now we have the board and we have more investors and we have a board of seven people in which we have the executive committee of three people that, you know, mainly run the show. And uh, then we have uh, this new company, which is linked with this uh, global company and smile this company in Portugal. Then we have uh, another GmbH company in Germany through which we do all our sales and, you know, most of our, uh, you know, like front end in Germany. And uh, that is, you know, like a little uh, introduction of Ensmile and how we work and, you know, uh, how we started off. 
And uh, Nippon, right, one thing which I forgot to mention that uh, in Smile, you know, we are an OEM manufacturer. So we do not uh, sell with our own label. So right now, as of now, like in these three years, so we are just selling it with our with the, the branding of other you know companies and other DSOs. So you know any person or any company or any group which wants to launch their own brands or which uh, are already in this aligned industry, so we are producing for them with their branding. So that has always uh, been our main key, you know, kind of business uh, feature. And I guess that is what we are going to be, you know, uh, following up in the future as well. So that is a little introduction of InSmile and what we have been doing. Oh, that's great. That's great. Thanks for explaining that. And and I'm very curious. I know we'll, we'll come into the public listing and then yeah. you opening up a factory uh, um, a center in Portugal as well. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, since how many years InSmile has been and you want to walk us through, like, how did you start uh, you know, how did you end up in this business or like, did you have anyone in like in your family yeah, or anyone so, who's a dentist? Like what, what led you to so this? Personally, you know, I did my mechanical engineering from uh, Queen Mary University of London. And uh, that is when, you know, I came up with this idea. This idea was pretty old, you know, like, and uh, as a fun fact, uh, which I guess most of the people know or not, but this uh, Invisalign or this aligners, these aligners were invented by a Pakistani guy. So, you know, that uh, was kind of a thing which hit me when I was studying there and, you know, this technology. So back in 1999, when he formed uh, Invisalign, Zaya Chishti, so uh, it was made in uh, CNC machines or, you know, like those kind of machines. But now this technology was evolving. And now recently in 2016 or 17, the idea of 3D printers and this, you know, like manufacturing of aligners came into existence before it was CNC and other, you know, cutting techniques. So I was doing mechanical engineering and my specialization was in 3D printing. So that is when I thought like, uh, how about I, you know, explore this market and there is a huge demand of uh, production of aligners for the other brands. You know, most of the companies would form a company and open their own laboratory and, you know, like they would be having a lot of expenses in the capital or uh, hiring staff or, you know, like the factory and everything. So that is uh, what came into my mind that how about I open a factory and we, you know, like supply for other brands. And so they do not have to open a factory or, you know, hire people and uh, so they can save all that money. So I started off uh, with a very, you know, less kind of resources. So I, after engineering, I went to Harvard. I did the entrepreneurship course. It's not a degree, it's a course. So that I did. Then after that, you know, I went to Pakistan, back to Pakistan. And uh, I opened the company while I was studying there in, in England uh, by the name of Ensmine Limited in the UK. And still that company is there. And uh, so this is how, you know, it started. And uh, but my degree and my specialization, it is engineering. And uh, most of the things in production of aligners that is linked with engineering. So, you know, everything related to aligner industry, it is basically engineering and softwares, you know. So this is the best combination that you can get with medical, dental and software uh, engineering and something. So this is, I guess, uh, how it all started. Because I was, I was, when you said mechanical engineering, that's what I was thinking, you know, yeah, did, yeah. did it lead because my wife is a dentist and I was talking to her, I think a few days ago, and we were talking yeah. about that, you know, dentistry is as much as in, it's more engineering than like traditional engineering than yeah. any, like even more than software engineering, because software is True. more soft developers. But when you True. talk about mechanical, chemical uh, and, you know, and adding that artistic touch, that's what makes a dentist. So they are truly actually the, the engineers of sorts, right? True, and I think that's true, where your true. mechanical engineering is coming into play as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope so. It uh, does help me in the future as well. But right now, I don't know anything about engines or anything, but all I know is aligners. <laughs> you know how to <laughs> so set up factories. Can... That is good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is good. That is good. That is good. Quick, quick, quick question. I know, I know, uh, and again, you know, uh, we, we were talking about the questions that, you know, we might discuss okay. during this. But, but I think you, you touched on a very important point that what triggered you to start and smile and one of the motivation factors was obviously uh you know the the birth of invisalign was from mm -hmm. uh you know someone from pakistan and you know that kind of influences does that like when you go back to pakistan does is that a talked about thing in the circles that you know such a big company uh, a person from that origin could make such a big company or 
is is there an ecosystem effect that is happening because we see a lot of uh, aligner companies or at least the uh, you know the the people who had worked in that industry uh, coming out from pakistan so is that like just trying to understand that is that more of an ecosystem effect mm -hmm. like you know you see a lot of footballers coming from brazil for example right? mm -hmm. not just brazil but is that something yeah, that i got your point with? yeah so nippon like uh, as a fun fact so one day i was you know visiting a doctor a very very famous doctor i wouldn't name him but uh, one of the most you know he's uh, number one provider of invisalign in germany so you can imagine like how big he would be so i was talking with him and he knew all the history of uh, invisalign and you know everything so he told me and he mentioned that he knows this he like know this like that pakistan has become switzerland of aligners so that is in real sense like uh, really if you go to pakistan so you would find so much good resources for aligners uh due to the fact that invisalign used to produce in pakistan for some you know years so all the people who left that company and now you know they knew all the skills they knew all the technology but now at once they were you know like jobless so since that time you know many new companies have come to pakistan and you would be amazed to know like uh, many big names in the market like one of the biggest names in germany like uh, and switzerland you know this name stroman so stroman everybody knows it and uh, i know i don't know if you know it or not that stroman has a very very big office in pakistan and many companies many big names i would not be able to you know mention the names but they are getting their aligners produced from pakistan and uh, because they know like the quality that they would be getting from those or that specific country that is not matchable to what they would be getting in europe or you know like uh, america or those countries obviously like the credibility is in these countries but uh, but the quality or the, the like the handmanship or something like this or the eye that you get in that country so that is amazing and really really like if you get a chance to go to pakistan or visit pakistan so you would see like uh, people are flowing there uh, <laughs> which are experts in aligners and you know like it's very very you know remarkable there and is it quite common like is that a profession because again i originally come from india right as you know then it's kind of it has taken off in the last few years but i'm assuming in pakistan it would have been like of all the asian countries it would have with Invisalign, with Clear Correct, because they launched these kind of very early in the journey of aligners. True, true. And obviously, that was a source country of where uh, you know the 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 aligners were being made or the treatment plans were being made. So, like I'm assuming that's a very stable, long la kind of industry going back decades, rather than just two to three years like other countries. True, 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 true. And uh, it is a very, very old kind of industry, as you have mentioned. But I guess, uh, the, like, in particularly, like, you know, like, India is famous for IT and, you know, those kind of things. And it's getting more and more famous day by day. So likewise, uh, since, you know, generations, Pakistan particularly is more famous for uh, medical and uh, instruments. You know, like, uh, I was seeing a summary, like, 48% or about more than that uh, percentage of the instruments, like medical instruments, like dental and medical. So they are coming from a small town in Pakistan called Sialkot. And, uh, you know, like, and same goes for uh, the football or for the sports goods. Like, you know, like, even in this year, like, uh, the last year's FIFA, so the football was uh, manufactured in Pakistan from a factory, again, in Sialkot. So, you know, like uh, there are some industries like aligners, like for uh, like sports goods and instruments. So Pakistan has skill still is on the top, like, you know, like uh, India is one of the top countries in uh, IT. So, you know, that privilege or that prestige we have that we are uh, like very much trained in producing these uh, medical, dental and uh, specifically aligners goods. So, and uh, the people who are pretty old in this industry, like, you know, like the big brands, so they know the value of Pakistan and they do not feel any shame, you know, because we are not that much, you know, uh, hyped in the media because, you know, uh, we are not uh, very much kind of a, a developed country, I would say, uh, in terms to other uh, European and American, you know, like uh, states. But like uh, for aligners and for uh, this medical industry so we are very much you know like uh, prestigious or we have our mark in the global market 
Got it, got it. And I think you mentioned about uh, the the craftsmanship, and I know that a lot of uh, again, you know, coming from the same region, that I think is that, and may, maybe I don't know if, if there is any facts around that or not. But you know that people are very much artistic, and a lot of the yeah. exposed, you know, there, so there's this art factor to aligners as well, apart true. from the science. So science could be learned, but art is a skill. Uh, um, yeah, true. And I'm just thinking that is that something that it may, there might be some relationship to that as well. Why it's the yeah, best one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, 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 true. Exactly, exactly, Nepal, exactly. But I guess uh, as soon as or as far as uh, the machines and automation is coming on the way, so you know, this artsmanship and all these things would be, you know. Like mm. transformed into machines and automation, so that is the sad part. And the future as not just in Pakistan, but you would see like even in Europe and you know those Western countries, like uh, there would be less or lesser needs uh, for hiring people, you know, because most of the things would be done by machines. So that is uh, kind of a thing which we would see in the next coming years that uh, all these. Uh, craftsmanship or artists in or these kind of things would be like replaced by machines. So now do you then, see that happening like within your company as well do you, did you have talks or upskilling the employees like i know yeah. that a lot of things have changed in the last 12 months since chat gpt was launched and it, it i'm assuming that our industry aligners has had ai and machine learning since very long even before the mainstream ai came in but that generative ai thing that is happening like what's happening you have a large company that you're managing so yeah. obviously hr and employees and you know retention upskilling what what are the talks happening inside the doors there very true so you know the first part of the treatment was already you know being done in uh, ai or software thing like the planning that has already been done in uh, you know in a coordination with ai and software and this so now uh, most of our production is automated as well. So, you know, look in our production unit in Portugal. So it is 85% automated. So, you know, the only thing that we are doing here, which is still manual, is the quality control. Because that we are not relying too much on the machines or we have to have our own skills in order to see if aligners are trimmed or, you know, like being sent to the clients uh, uh, right or wrong. But rest of the things, they are being done on the machines. Like there is no process, which I remember right now in Pakistan, we still have some people who are doing hand tripping. But in Portugal, our, uh, you know, our, uh, our new upcoming factory in the States, so that would be and this, comp this factory in Portugal, that is all uh, automated. So you can imagine like how it is already being transformed in and smile as well. And in the future, we are looking for more and more ways to, you know, like bring AI and automation into our industry. And uh, the more automation uh, comes, so the more QC uh, fail rate is less. So I guess uh, that is, uh, which is uh, what is very important and what we are working on uh, within our company as well. So, yeah. So. Cool. And when you talk about, and I think that's a good kind of going into a second sector section of the questions, which is on technology, right? So I think automation yeah. is one thing. And I think for you, the main kind of pillar is uh, manufacturing and automation within manufacturing. So mm -hmm. like define or maybe, you know, just talk about what kind of, um, you know, the digital strategy or technology, let's start from mm -hmm. there, right? Yeah. So when you're thinking of, let's say, this, the starting days, right? When you were thinking of it was all manual, what were the tools you were using then to date when you're thinking of automating more than 85% of your production line? Yeah. What are the things you are doing now and how the things have progressed from there or what you have added in terms of, uh, you know, uh, services, tools, technologies and, you know, devices, maybe machineries, you know, everything and everything. Yeah. Over there. Yeah. So one difference that uh, we have seen in, the, in this industry is Nippon that uh, nowadays everything is becoming very easy. So, you know, right now, like three years ago, or we as a small company, so we were uh, trimming the liners by hand and, you know, like we used to thermoform it on BioStars and, you know, like manually one by one. And then we have to tally the numbers and then it would go into the other section. So, you know, it was all manual and there were there, there was too much room for uh, like QC errors or those kind of things. 
but now everything is being done on the big you know machines in which you put the rolls in and you know it is doing uh, thermoforming in kind of a conveyor belt kind of a system and then you put the aligners or this model in the trimming machine and then it does the trimming on the five axis kind of a thing on its own and then it goes to the other department in a conveyor belt on its own so i guess most of the things that we used to do back then so it has changed completely uh what i uh, would mention here is that uh, how we guys are thinking so there are many manufacturers machine manufacturers who are thinking the same as well so you know like uh, i would mention that the companies who used to manufacture the machines uh, like biostars or those kind of companies like vacuum forming machines so they are now working on the new uh, technologies and the bigger machines as well or automated machines as well so it is not that we have to do an r and d on that section or produce a machine or our own so uh, right now the good thing on in this technology is that many machines we can get it off the shelf shelf like we have the suppliers or the manufacturers in which from which we can buy the machines and we can place them uh the thing that we are working right now on uh, or and smile is focusing on is the software or artificial intelligence that we can incorporate into the system so that is something that we have uh, all our heads in and we have recently developed a new software it is kind of a case management software and kind of a ai uh, like the part ai kind of software in which cases would be submitted and you know every production step would be done in that software kind of a thing so that is our uh, new now next goal uh, that uh, how do we indulge or integrate those machines with the software and uh, we can have this controlling power or this controlling thing can be done through those uh, ai features or softwares or those kind of things so that is nipon what we are working right now on and that is part of uh, technology that we are focusing on right now so machines are uh, one part but uh, this ai and software development and it that is what we have uh, you know what we are focusing on and how's your how's your team like like when we talk about the you know the high volume of you know people that you have in your team like uh -huh. how how what is the split like like how many are like dentists technicians you know management team sales team like how does it yeah, how does yeah. It so for us for an oem company so sales is a very integral part so we have mm -hmm. if i would split it so we have uh, about 80% people in production and when i say production so that includes the doctors as well because uh, a lot of the role that production has is with planning is with planning and uh, in planning we have uh, you know a uh, general doctors and then orthodontists and those people so i would say like uh, if we categorize or if we uh, like you know differentiate production as well so it would be about 80% would be production in the company within that production 60% would be uh, you know like general people for production and for the other stuff and 40% would be doctors and you know like technicians and dental kind of trained staff and uh, then 20% of the people we would be having in our factory that is sales and administrative team and you know like uh, management and those kind of people and uh, with us so we do not have to you know sell the liners with our own brand name so we don't have those hefty costs uh, for marketing and for sales but we do have to spend a lot on uh, the machinery and for technology and for those kind of things so that is what we usually you know like uh, like have our focus on so this is the uh, kind of the system or uh, that how and smile works with or our process flow and and great so i think because we were talking about sales and i think you you kind of um... Uh, extended the portuguese you know unit and the new office that you have so what made you very curious you know so you were already in a thriving market which was developing and there was a huge scope within pakistan as well mm -hmm. you went public there and then there is this portuguese so it's is this a separate company in itself or and is it more to capture the european side of the market being closer yeah. to that side is that the reason here yeah. yeah so we are the, actually a one group so n smile is a group so uh, under n smile we have five companies uh, one company is in america uh, by the name of n smile americas so it's a registered company then we have one company in ua uh, with the name of n smile international then we have another company in germany with the name of n smile gmbh then we have a company in portugal with the name of n smile portugal 
and all those companies are linked with this uh, you know group company uh, n smile which is considered as n smile global and uh, so the management and all the people are you know uh, working under the same leadership or the same umbrella and uh, the reason that we came to europe uh, nepon or going uh, for another factory in america and not just operating from pakistan is that uh, right now one thing is the delivery you know like there are many uh, countries from which if we deliver it from pakistan so it takes a lot more time uh, compared to it's been delivered from europe or america directly. so that is the reason number 1 reason number 2 is like uh, in some countries uh, there is still a little bit of a like i would not say it a problem but a little bit of a concern that uh, a product coming from pakistan and if it's written made in pakistan so they uh, if they are sending it directly to their clients uh, when i say clients their patients so they feel that if they claim that their company is let's say german and if the product is coming from pakistan so it does not make any sense for them so you know like in order to make it easy for our clients and for our future prospective clients so we thought like it would be good that we have you know like uh, more factories and uh, we are i would say proudly that we are the only oem company or only oem group which has multiple factories you know mostly you know like companies have just one unit and they keep developing that same unit into becoming more bigger and bigger and but our strategy is to open more countries and open new factories in different locations so that is what the n smile or how n smile is working uh, different to those uh, or uh, different oem groups i think i think you mentioned about that and that is what we hear more on the feedback when we talk to the clients as well so you will see a lot of big uh, you know manufacturers and labs in us in europe uh, mm-hmm. and then there are in asia as well including india and pakistan and you know southeast asia as well but then the problem is logistics and if if you talk to dentists obviously you know we do that on a day day to day basis it's yes price is one quality is another variable third is logistics and i think True. that is where the the problem is and and a lot of times like even just to give an example so my wife works in northern ireland uh mm-hmm. she's a general dentist she ships her aligners from europe and she's sitting mm-hmm. in uk uh not that far away until brexit everything was okay now everything yeah. is although it's sent through dhl Uh, yeah. it's still held at customs uh, even yeah. though you might be sending from you know just you know 50 kilometers across the pond uh, it will true, take true, true. weeks for sometimes weeks and then there are, there are these patients sitting in the reception or calling the clinic that where are my aligners uh, you promised me you know you took 3000 pounds from me and now i'm getting this service and then they they are just chasing the labs you know where they when it's held in the customs so i think that is something that we have seen um, not so when it comes to us price is a big factor it's not cheap it's very expensive it reduces the accessibility mm-hmm. europeans True. ones are good and i think that's it, it seems it's a really good strategy uh, mm-hmm. to have presence in at least in different continents if not mm-hmm. every country i think that's mm-hmm. a really nice uh, yeah, strategy yeah yeah so that is what we are working on upon and uh, just you know pray that we uh, succeed in our uh, vision and aim and that is you know how and smile is working and we are very hopeful and very optimistic that uh, in the future coming uh, years we would be if not you know one of the biggest oem companies in the world and that is uh, what we see ourselves right now as well yeah no so i think th- that's because i i see you are you have a very good grand vision of and smile global in general yeah yeah and so how how difficult it has been i'm just thinking that why are the companies are not able to do it and i have i have spoken to a lot of other companies as well they do not have again i think american companies that's fine because they don't see a lot of them us is a big market in itself so they don't have to look outside of us at times okay. european companies do have to so i'm just trying to understand that why was it um, you know why the other companies are not doing it is it like obviously it's difficult to enter into the markets coming from a different country and different legal side of things what's the difficulty there and wh- why you were able to do it and not others i guess uh, one of the main reasons is uh, that uh, those companies you know they have their head offices and they are uh, expanding their teams uh, or their team within that country 
and one more reason that if uh, a company needs to establish a new factory so you know a little bit or uh, some part of the management has to go there as well so uh, a little you know kind of uh, attention is uh, diversified or you know distributed and just to give you an example right it's been about two months that i did not go back to pakistan even if i want to there are many things that are pending in pakistan and i want to you know finish them but still there are more pending things in portugal so that is i guess uh, one of the reasons that when companies see like they are too much indulged or too much you know like uh, hand tied in the country in which they are already expanding in so that could be one of the reasons and uh, number two is uh, you know this uh, i would not say the cost but this uh, like difficulty in opening a new country and the company and you know finding a space and you know it is a very long procedure and getting the certifications for that so Nippon, just for Portugal, so we started our company and started getting the certifications three years back. So you can imagine like it takes about uh, an average time of two and a half to three years in order to open a factory and, you know, get the certifications. And I'm not uh, talking about the, just the medical certifications. I'm talking about health and safety, fire and safety, you know, then city halls and then that certification, then this department would come. So, you know, I guess... Uh, Many countries think like in order to or uh, if they need to go again to all those procedures, so it is good like they just keep spending or keep expending uh, uh, in the same uh, company in which they are or factory in which they are. This is what I think like because these are the problems that I faced uh, on a very large scale here in Portugal. Yeah, no, it's it's very um, courageous of you, I would say that, you know, to open up. And I think that a lot of uh, companies coming from that side of the world, I think there's one way to look at only domestic market, but then the other thing is global. So was that yeah. thinking global already always in your the top priority? Like you always thought of, you know, that this end smile, like you have to make it global company, like multiple location, or did it come as you were saturating in Pakistan, which I don't think was the case, but was that more of a kind of something you learned and then you pivoted to, you know, let's look globally from just domestic. So first I will talk about, you know, my personal self. So when I was about, I guess, if I remember correctly, and I have this in my notes as well, when I was 14 years old, so I made myself a promise that uh, I always have to compete, you know, global. And I would open one day a company which would be a global company. So that was my aim since I was 14 years old. So I used to say in my own language and I would be like translate that as well, but you would understand because you come. So my, like, you know, my saying and my family knows it that my uh, competition is a Pakistan is a small country. Hai. So that means like uh, my competition or our competition is with the world like it or globally, not just with Pakistan. And uh, since our day uh, one, so we are not selling uh, any aligner in Pakistan or it's not like that we do not want to, but there are not too much big brands in Pakistan that we are able to sell to, you know, and unfortunately, you know, the prices or the things that we get in uh, you know, that subcontinent, including India, Pakistan, like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, so that are not those kind of prices that we would be getting from other countries. So since day one, we had this vision of going global and we are a global company. And I guess uh, it's been more than two years, Nippon, that we are already selling to more than 18 countries. And uh, now we are uh, getting more and more countries on uh, in loop. And uh, recently we got our FTA 510K certification as well, which allowed us to export to now to America as well. And there are many less companies as you know, who have this certification. And, uh, and it takes about one, one and a half year to get this single certification because that includes so much documentation, so much testings. So, yeah, so you can imagine like uh, that uh, this is kind of a thing that we had in the, the past and now we are following the same paths as well. No, congratulations on the FDA. I think I saw yeah, that yeah, yeah. post somewhere on LinkedIn, but yeah, it, it, I know it's uh, even getting one thing, smaller things done, it's a painful process, but you know, uh, you know, getting everything and then on top of that, you have to get the FDA clearances. Uh, thank, you well. uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, brother. Cool. So quickly, uh, I think let's ask the, let's go to the next question in terms of what are the gaps that you are seeing Gohar in the, because I think you worked in different geographies, you have worked with different suppliers. When mm -hmm. it comes to, let's start with general clear aligners, right? Uh, again, it doesn't have to be what the strategies that you're working on, but in general, like what are the gaps that you see 
within the industry and b within the technology because again the the format of this podcast is around the digital dentistry side of things so when it comes to the digital dentistry what are the gaps you are seeing there so maybe we start with the general industry first where you are seeing the things are not moving uh, as mm-hmm. you would expect mm-hmm. so gaps you are trying to uh, ask just in the digital dentistry like section yeah, right like start uh, with other ways right doesn't matter i think general industry or okay to be specific okay i guess uh, the gaps that people had uh, in the past was that uh, they or right now even like uh, so one thing was like patient and doctor like the patient and the doctor they could not uh communicate or link with each other uh, on a software or uh, online so you know there was a thing by they used to communicate uh, through phones or emails or this so i guess that uh, has been a very very kind of a big gap and still is a gap that uh, once the patient gets a treatment or uh, so he is the patient is not linked into any software or any app through which he can communicate with the doctor or you know the doctor can track Uh, the patient's case like uh, you know if the patient is wearing the next liner or not and if uh, there is enough compliance in this or not so i guess that is something you know which uh, still needs a little bit of a working to be done on this on this patient and doctor kind of an interface or this uh, uh, communication direct communication with the doctor or any of his junior doctor or something like this then i guess uh, another gap which is uh, getting filled very you know rapidly that is uh, the you know the doctors uh, nipun so we have seen in the past or still now we see that uh, the doctors or specifically the orthodontists they want to add a little bit of their own touch into the plan and let's say if we send them the plan so they just do or they want to do a little bit of a revision just to show that we are uh, in charge of this treatment and we want to and you know and sometimes we think like the, the changes they are asking like it's unnecessary but then we feel like they want to have their own kind of you know ownership into the plan so right now the new technology or the new thing which is into the market is like people or the companies are offering now uh, that the doctors can do their own movement just like you know invisalign is offering so once you the doctor gets the plan so he can do his own movements on the software by his own hands and then he can you know send it to the company so in that way he would be having this ownership of the case so that is uh, coming in now into the market and we are offering that as well so many less companies or many few companies are offering this feature right now for, i'm talking about oem and uh, even for the big brands like they do not uh, uh, like give the plans to doctors in which the doctor can do the plans uh, revision as well by his own hand so that is something you know which we uh, would be seeing in the future as well which would be getting very very common uh, recently or in the future then one thing which some companies started but they are not able to get that good feature which is involved with the ai so you know once let's say you take a picture from your phone and uh, there would be any software in which you know the phone or that app or that ai feature converts your teeth your misaligned teeth into a designed or aligned teeth and uh, it shows you or gives you a little bit of a calculation that how much aligner that would be needed so many companies have done it but they have not achieved that good feature or that good you know kind of an uh, i would say like user friendly tool in which the patient can use this tool very easily or there would be an app in which he can play around and you know check like how his results would look like and uh, i guess that would be a very kind of a salient feature or a marketing tool for the clients as well that if there is kind of an open app in which a patient can do his own smile check or something like this so that would be a wonderful thing so i guess uh, that if you guys are able to do it in smile genius and i guess uh, <laughs> that would be a something which would be a very remarkable tool and then the patient can choose in over its own company as well like uh, that uh, if i am able to do it then these are the options that i have and you know i can do from company a company b company c and company a is charging me this company b is charging me this so i guess that could be a wonderful tool so which i see like uh, which would be getting it from the market very soon yeah no i think thanks thanks for sharing that and thanks for going into the depth of uh, you know i think the the first thing the patient communication side of things i think that's where um, you know obviously you know smile genius has worked in and that's where we work in and what we have seen is that the patient monitoring app that we have 
is like there's getting a lot more traction there is a lot more ask and there's more wow mm-hmm. feature obviously the bulk mm-hmm. of the work is behind in the case management portals in the doctor mm-hmm. facing and the lab portals but it's the the selling point always becomes the the monitoring app so i think that's where uh, you know the 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 ask is going and i think you are right right it it becomes a marketing tool it's more mm-hmm. compliance is one right that's the underneath underlying mm-hmm. kind of thing mm-hmm. but True. for everyone it becomes a, a wow factor it it becomes it brings the fun and the game gaming thing within the treatment mm. having an app true. and playing around with that yeah and true, showing true, it showing true, it off true. <laughs> true 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 cool i think quickly i think we are towards the end of this um, so just trying to understand you know uh, i know that you are kind of operating this multiple location based international business mm-hmm. and it's tough you mentioned that you haven't been back home in the last 2 months which is not mm-hmm. easy So yeah. what is a typical day now in today's life like how is your typical day like and and you know like what are the things that typically you would be doing and how do you create that balance i see you as a very balanced god like that's something i do talk to mm-hmm. a lot of people you're very much balanced you're mm-hmm. very humble you're always smiling so how do you create that balance in your day to day life what your typical day looks like mm-hmm. so i guess one thing for sure that, that i uh, give my time to the office so you know like there are few hours which i do not work from home and i like uh, like try that i sit in the office and you know like because i get the environment so i wake up early and i go to the gym early morning and then you know then drop off my daughter to the school and then after that i just go to the office and uh, by evening or till evening i stay in my office and try to you know finish all the works uh, till here and after 6 so unfortunately or fortunately i have another office that i need to look at which is in america because then the time zone is different there so then that office is you know waking up or you know they are a little bit active so then my work from home starts so then what i do is like my headphone is uh, always uh, in my ear and uh, i'm just taking the calls and you know picking or managing the things very remotely and uh, then there are clients you know like uh, there are many clients who wants to talk to me directly so even we have with the team or we have the staff but still there are many people who even i want to talk to them directly or they want to have a personal contact with me so you know it is uh, mostly nipon that uh, that now mostly my things after 5 o'clock they are being done on the phone and then after 8 or 9 i try to give a little bit time to my family as well so i guess this is how my work is uh, passed uh, on a daily basis so it is a show off uh, from uh, 7 till 8 uh, till the night and then after that i eat dinner and you know then it's a family time and if there is any urgent call then i always happy to attend it but you know then i try to stay at home Yeah, no, no, I know, I know how you're managing. I, I'm, I can only assume the way you are managing it, so it would yeah. be very, very difficult as well. Cool. I think thanks for answering that last question, and then we'll wind up. Uh, yeah. Go quickly. What three trends are you seeing in the industry? That, mm. and I know we talked about slightly about automation and AI that mm. you're saying. Mm. So, what are the three trends? Three trends that you are thinking of, you're reading about, or mm. you know that you're hearing about. Mm. in within the, the industry the three trends the three trends that i have seen and uh, which i see would be coming up very soon and after seeing some exhibitions and uh, forums so one is like uh, people or companies uh, after seeing so much wastage uh, with the plastics and this so now they are starting direct printing of liners so you know that is something which i guess like in the next 5 to 10 years that would be very common there would be no need of printing the models and there would be printers which would be printing the aligners uh, directly so that is number one upon i would say number two is that uh, now uh, it is a need of all the companies to incorporate ai into their uh, manufacturing procedures so you know right now the quality control or like the staff management or uh, the delivery time or everything so there would be softwares that would be managing everything in the company uh, starting from quality control till packaging and you know lead times and client onboarding and everything so that is number 2 you know the uh, ai on the procedure side and uh, then i guess the last uh, thing that i see as a trend after seeing the you know the failure of smile direct club is that uh, more and more doctors would be coming uh, into the loop or the limelight you know like uh, 
the companies which are mostly B2C, they would be obsolete or would be finished and they would be converted it into like B2B kind of companies like business to business in which doctors would be still holding the stare uh, or the, you know, steering of the car and they would be, you know, driving the whole uh, thing. And I guess this is uh, going to be a trend in the future that uh, the treatment is going to be, you know, done by the doctors. They would be doing the planning as well. And the, the companies uh, have to give the plans, planning softwares or would be doing half of the work and the rest of the things would be done by doctors. Otherwise, you know, patients would not be agree agreeing to it, you know, until that their doctors are not doing the plans. So that is something which I think like would be coming uh, on into the future as well. Oh, cool. I think complete. Yeah. I think we, we didn't touch on Smile Direct Club, but I think that's a really good take on on the yeah, changing B two B mostly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I know we thank we kind of spent much, more okay. than our <laughs> scheduled time, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I knew we had a late start much. as well. But thank you. Uh, it was really nice episode, and I think that you you were very honest and very. Um, humble in your replies and responses. Yeah, it wasn't thank you very scripted much, brother. in any way. <laughs> so yeah. I think I really, really like. So I think thank you for your time. Thanks for. Yeah. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, and if you are, you know, entering into the journey of starting your own Clearliner services or setting up a manufacturing unit or uh, setting up a chain of clinics offering Clearliners. You need a really good quality software, which should have the case management uh, side of things, which should have a, a remote monitoring side of things, and also should be white labeled. Smile Genius Dental provides you all in one software to do everything that you will need on those key areas. We provide you with the doctor's portal, which is the dentist facing portal where they can submit the cases and remote monitor the patient's progress. We provide the labs with the lab case management side of things where they can manage the incoming requests from the uh, doctors, but also have visibility of the, the operation side from the patient side as well. And then we have provided you with the patient monitoring app because it's all about compliance and engagement at the end. So Smile Genius Dental is the all-in-one platform, which is white labeled for your brand to provide you with your, your, your consumers with that end-to-end -end experience to provide more efficiency and productivity to your business without needing you to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and a years of you know development time to build the software yourself. So uh, call in uh, to our team or book an appointment with us and we'll be happy to walk you through what Smile Genius is all about. But until next time, uh, stay tuned for the next really good episode of the Digital Dentistry Deep Dive podcast.